On behalf of Pastor Phil and the family at Believer's Christian Church, we are excited to sow this message into your life. Our mission at Believer's is to love God, love people, and serve both. Our prayer is that through this message, you will receive revelation that will bring a lasting change into your life. To find out more about us, log on to BelieversChristianChurch.com. We've been on a, a series. This is the, the final message that we're going to use or end on, on the series that we started a few weeks ago, Changing the World. And, uh, you know, it sounds so, so grandiose, so motivational, you know, let's go change the world. And, uh, and, I, and I, I get it. I think that we've, we have people in different walks of life that have had disappointments and discouragements. And, and so they, we've come to build up cases in our mind. It's not so much that we think that God isn't capable of changing the world through people. I'm just not so confident that he's able to change the world through me. And that's where most of us land. Certainly there's, uh, uh, there's people out there that are doing great things, but I'm just not one of them. I jokingly started out this series saying that if I went back and asked the eight-year-old version of you, do you think it was, if we asked that little boy or little girl, could God change the world through you? You would have said yes. Now, it might have looked like a Superman cape and an S on your shirt, but you did believe that you, God could use, use someone like you to change the world. And so we, uh, that was where we started. Then the second, um, well, let me, let me make sure I point this out, that in order to change the world, changing we starts with God changing me. And that's, that's, that's what it starts with. It doesn't take a big name. It doesn't take a big platform. It doesn't take everyone knowing you or having a big wallet or having financial backing. It starts with, and all it takes is having an encounter with a great big God. And that changes everything. Secondly, uh, picked on the fact that most Christians, or I say that, maybe reverse, many Christians, a lot of Christian culture, uh, are, are ones that are just taking in all of the things that are going in in the world, and we think, man, oh man, this world's getting so evil and dark, and, and we get into paranoia, like, the, like a maniac looking through the blinds, you know, look at how bad it's getting out there. Come, Lord Jesus, quickly and save us from all this evil and all these evil people when God has called us to be the rescuers. In uh, Acts chapter 1, when Jesus was ascending to heaven, the disciples watched him go, and then they stood there so long that a couple angels showed up and said, guys, beat it, okay? Go do the stuff. Get over to Jerusalem, would you, so we can get you filled with the Holy Spirit and to be empowered to be witnesses. We are called to be influencers in our culture. My, my platform happens to be behind a pulpit. My office is in a church. Your platform might look like a, t a classroom. Uh, your, your platform or your pulpit may, may look like a landscape business. We all have an atmosphere that we are called to influence and not just go and, and be quiet, uh, be ones that get beat up on and just rescue me, Lord Jesus, get me out of here quickly. That's not going to change the world. But we think change in the world. Oh, man. Okay, if I really worked hard at it, if I really went, did it, did, paid the price, then maybe, maybe I could do something that would change the world. Has anyone ever been in a situation where you've had yourself so convinced that something was going to be so radically difficult that once you did it, you thought, oh man, what was I waiting for? That was way easier than I thought. That's, that's where I'm heading today. That changing the world is a whole lot more simple than we think. It's a whole lot more simple than we think. So turn with me in your Bibles or your devices to Ephesians chapter 4. If you don't have your Bibles, that's all right. We're going to put the verses on the screen. And if you need a Bible, you're going to come see me after church anyway. So you won't have that excuse next week. I'm excited. I'm always excited. I'm an excitable person. Um, but it's not because of who, just because I, that's my nat natural personality. I'm, I'm optimistic. I've been charged of being overly optimistic. Not because, again, that's my, that's my natural bend. I'm just that way because I've had an encounter with a big God. So this morning, if we had seat belts on the chairs, I'd say fasten them. Make sure that your items are s stowed under the seat in front of you because we are going to take off and have a great time this morning. Amen? So you're already in Ephesians 4, but before we go there, how many can agree this morning that common sense just isn't common anymore? <laughs> Most hands go up. <laughs> you got that right, Pastor. Common sense just is not common anymore. And you know, in Christian culture, unfortunately, that's true too. We, we, uh, we have these ideas of changing the, the world as having the big, big moments. You know, uh, as, a te as a teenager, when I got saved, all of us kids, be, we were going to be these great missionaries, you know, preaching to hundreds of thousands and have mega churches and just ask us. We, we had all this stuff figured out. You know, we we're going to be the, the world famous and all of these things. 
And we thought that just so long as I could stand on a platform in front of 100,000 people, then, then I'm really changing the world. But you know, Jesus actually said in, in John 13, let's look at that, that verse. Jesus said, when you want to change the world or prove the, to the world, he says, there, you're going to prove to the world that you're my followers, my disciples, because of your love for one another. Prove to the world that you're a follower of Jesus by your love one for another. So it could be said this, and you should write this down. Changing the world is about demonstration, not affiliation. Changing the world is about demonstration, not affiliation. I ran into a, a gentleman uh, in a conversation. We were talking about uh, the church here. And, and so after I was just kind of telling some stories about what was happening, he, uh, basically, he looked right at me. He says, yeah, I, the church I go to is dead. And uh, I, he, I said, well, then you really should look for another place to go. Uh, no, I, I couldn't do that to my pastor. I want to honor my pastor and uh, feel an obligation to him. And I said, listen, you're not doing your pastor or your church any favors by staying simply because you just said to me in a conversation, and you know I'm a pastor, you just told me your church is dead. What are you saying to other people? What other colorful words are you using to describe the church that you feel so loyal to? You, I told them, you're not helping anybody. So let me say this to you. If you feel like this church is dead, let me help you find a place that you <laughs> feel that you don't because you're not helping the church and you're certainly not helping me. I'm going to partner with you. We're going to find you a church that you can be more happy serving at, okay? Yeah. I don't know, but we'll get in faith. Uh, but so we demonstrate that we're followers of him of our, because of our love one for another. Awfully simple, isn't it? I, I love the fact that I turn around corners or I overhear people talk about in this church. I know I'm biased because this is the church that I attend and I pastor, but if you ever had a chance to watch the video that we made about eight months ago when it's about nine minutes long, they're on, on YouTube right now, if you went to Believer's Church Eagle, you can watch the video. It's about, um, there's about 350 views on it. I'm probably 349 of them. <laughs> yeah, you'll see Andrew's face on it. Because I watch it all the time. I watch it and I cry and I watch it and I cry and I watch it and I cry. Because i just listening to the testimonies of what people are saying, not just about what God's doing, but what, what God's doing through people and how God has impacted um, them through the people of this church. It's how we're going to change the world, our love one for another. Do you know there are people that are in church cultures that are just as lost in religious tradition as those that are lost in the world in, in their sin? And so changing their, they need the love of God. They need to have their life changed as well, just as much as those that have no relationship at all with God. In Acts chapter 3, Peter and John are, are walking into uh, Gate Beautiful. I, I use this analogy all the time. And, and they see the beggar. Everyone sees the beggar every single day. And, and so he asks them for money. And Peter's like, you know, I don't have any money on me, but what I've got, I'll give to you. And he reaches down and he says, in the name of Jesus, get up and walk. The man was healed. He goes leaping and dancing around. He goes into the temple and everyone knows this guy because everyone walks by him. In fact, the people are so amazed that, and they find out that Peter and John are the ones that got him healed. They start worshiping them. And they start, and then finally Peter and John are like, stop, hold it. <laughs> I'm just the hose, man. He, God just used me. And it wasn't me. You're worshiping the wrong one. We need to worship Jesus. Well, this really upset the religious uh, leaders of that day. And so they grabbed them and took them before a council and began to interrogate them. And this is where I want to pick up in Acts chapter 4. This is what the response was by the religious leaders in, uh, in Acts 4, verse something. Verse 13. It says, now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated, common men, they were astonished and they recognized that they had been with Jesus. Yeah. It's not about affiliation with Jesus. It was demonstration. And that broke down the walls of the religious lost, if I could say it that way. So you're already there at Ephesians chapter 4. Common sense just isn't common anymore. So I want to talk about the simplicity before I get into the core of my message. And I love how Paul writes to the church in Ephesus in verse 29. He says, uh, excuse me, verse 28. He says, if you're a thief, quit stealing. Simple enough, right? Instead, use your hands for good, for good hard work. And then give generously to others in need. Don't use foul or abusive language to let every... Uh, language, let everything that you say be good and helpful so that your words will be an encouragement to those who hear them. And do not bring sorrow to, the, to uh, God's Holy Spirit by the way that you live. Remember, 
He's identified you as his own, guaranteeing that you will be saved on the day of redemption. Get rid of bitterness and rage, anger and harsh words, and slander, as well as all types of evil behavior. Instead, be kind to each other, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, just as God, through Christ, has forgiven you. This is the simplicity. We don't need an audience of 100,000. What we need is to be sweet. We need to be generous to the poor waitress or the poor waiter that just made a mistake on your, on your meal. We don't need to manifest something that isn't godly. How do we do that? That sounds a whole lot like performance. Well, he says it, he answers that question in the very final part of verse 32. He says, just as God through Christ has forgiven you. You know, it's awfully difficult to, uh, to be grateful and be angry at the same time. Sure, I'm glad you came here today, Nick. Bless God. Doesn't match, does it? Sure, I'm glad my body's healed. Bless God. Doesn't match. It's really difficult to be sour, bitter, and unlovely, unkind to people when you're constantly thinking about how I am forgiven, that I am the one that God rescued. I am the one that was pathetic and lost and dead, and he saved me. He rescued me. You want to change the culture around you. Let's be recklessly generous. Do you know it's a fact that uh, restaurants and waiters and waitresses uh, hate Sundays more than any other day of the week? Because church people are the stingiest and most demanding. Ouch, right? How about we change that? How about if you're going to be stingy and, and mean and don't leave a tip, please don't wear your believer shirt to the restaurant. Please, please don't even mention that you're a Christian, okay? We, we have, you know, it's, it's, it really is simple. It's just being generous, being sweet, being kind, being polite. Being polite to your wife, being polite to your husband, your children, your neighbors. It's, it seems like common sense, doesn't it? But you know, when we're constantly reminded of the forgiveness and the joy and the love and the grace of God, that is the key. I'm not going to, it's going to be very difficult for me to be bitter and angry and hold, hold charges against you when I realize that all the charges have been dropped from me. Amen? All right, so let's get into the meat of the message this morning. I want to show you the simplicity of changing the world. Revelation chapter 12. If you turn all the way to the back of your Bible, Revelation chapter 12, verse 11. Uh, there's two things that in this, this verse that I think are going to be really key to us as we leave this place today and really key to us in our Christian walk. Uh, we all need to be in a place of victory in our salvation and all of us have a desire to do something that's meaningful. Everyone wants to make an impact on someone else. We, we don't want it. We can only go through the motions so long before you feel like you're just the treadmill of life, the treadmill of Christianity, and you, you just don't want to do it anymore. We all want to be doing something. Well, I want to show you how simple it really is to both live in a place of victory and then also have the power to bring victory in other people's lives. So if you're already there, Revelation chapter 12, verse 11, just a real short verse. says, And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto death. So in verse number 10, you'd read, Who is the him? It's the accuser. It's Satan, our adversary. We, we overcome him by the blood of the Lamb. I already told you that as a teenager, when I came to church the first time, we were singing songs and hearing words that I'd never heard before. Uh, to, to be totally transparent with you, when it came to Easter, I had no idea it had anything to do with Jesus. All I ever knew was the, the bunny and eggs. I had no idea there was, it was such a powerful holiday. And uh, so we sing about the Lamb of God, and I'm, all I could envision, again, I should, how naive I was, the narrow gate, wide gate, I'm thinking, why are we singing about a fuzzy little lamb in heaven? I just couldn't get mad around it. So let's, let's not make the assumption that everyone knows that this verse, because if you're hearing it for the first time, it seems awfully odd. We overcome the enemy, the Satan, by a, a lamb. Well, the blood of the lamb is, is simply this reference. Throughout all of, of Christian history, there has always been a need for a shedding of blood to deal with sin or making covenants. Well, during the Mosaic law, law time or during the Old Covenant, in order to have your sins covered, you would have to bring a sacrifice. It might be a dove. It might be a lamb or uh, a goat. Uh, you bring it every day to sacrifice to cover your sins. And then once a year was the offering of atonement. 
And this would be the, the time where the high priest would take the, the sacrifice into the most holy place, which is the center of the, the temple, and he would sacrifice that time, and that would offer a covering for the, all of Israel for the whole year. But it, was, it wasn't sustained. It had to be done every single year. And so God in his provision, he provides Jesus as the lamb of God, the perfect lamb of God, to sacrifice so that this blood would be shed, not just covering sins, but cleansing us of our sins. And so the writer of Hebrews says it this way in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 10, says, by that will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. He says, Christ's death perfects and sanctified. And every high priest stands ministering daily and offering repeatedly the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. It just covered them. It says, but this man, it's capital M, speaking of Jesus, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, he sat down at the right hand of God. From that time, waiting till his enemies are made his footstool, for by one offering he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. We're talking about changing the world. In order to change the world for God, number one, you have to respond to the sacrifice that was made for you and I. That was Jesus, the Lamb of God. So that, that rescue, that saving, that changing of everything starts with me. Remember, I can't change we until he has changed me. So overcoming, being victorious in this life and changing the world starts with responding to the blood of the Lamb. I no longer have to be fearful that there's the wrath of God now pending on me. I'm no longer in fear of his punishment. I'm now a son. You're a daughter, a son, if you've responded to him. So the second part of this verse is, by the word of their testimony, loving not their lives even unto death. A testimony is a funny thing. It's more simple than what most of us have, have made it. Again, uh, growing up, we had, if you've been in church culture long enough, who remembers the, the term, the Romans road? Anyone ever go through like a Bible training, the Romans road? And the Romans road was simply this, where uh, you went through the, the four or five verses that walked someone through what it meant to become a Christian. Well, I remember going through these trainings uh, as a teenager, trying to remember where to take somebody through the Romans Road. And I, here I'm practicing with someone that I know, and I couldn't get through it, and I'm getting, I'm getting discouraged. What it reminded me of is, if you've ever gotten a call in the middle of the day from a telemarketer, <laughs> and you know they're reading from a script, this is going to be mean. I know they're just, they're just trying to do their job, but it's really entertaining to me. When you purposely ask them a question that you know is going to take them off their script and watch how they fumble, that's how I felt like uh, I was when I was being taught this Romans road. Because when someone asked me a question, I wasn't giving a testimony from my experience. What I was giving was a script that I was taught. And it seemed a whole lot more difficult. I felt like I couldn't even share it with someone I knew. How was I going to share it with a stranger? And so then I was, just felt reluctant. I'm not sure what to say. I'm going to get it wrong. It was, it was really awkward. And so tes testifying or witnessing became very uncomfortable for, for me and most of us that I knew. So what is a testimony? If I were at the stop sign uh, over here at, at M100 in Grand River and waiting for my turn to go and someone comes barreling through, they run the stop sign, they collide with another car and there's a fatal accident right in front of me. Now they're, 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 they're finding charges against this individual, they take them to trial and they call upon me to come be a witness of what I saw. And so they sit me in a stand and all I can do is testify of what I've seen. I can't share or tell them what someone else said. I can't, that's hearsay. I can't share with some, something that I didn't see. I can't add to it and I can't take away. They only want to know exactly what I saw. And so to, a testimony for you and I is simply our story. A couple of weeks ago, I went, uh, I had the privilege of going fishing. And uh, if you were to ask me about that trip, I could tell you, all the details. I could tell you what the wind was like, the, the overcast. I could tell you what depths of water we were fishing, what baits we were using. I could tell you about our conversation. I could tell you what the boat looks like. I can tell you the, the conversation we had with the guy pulling the boat out afterwards. I know all the details and I could tell you all just right off the cuff because it's my story. I don't need to have the notes written down. It's effortless for me. I'm just telling you my part. That's what a testimony is for a Christian. I'm just telling you the story. It's not scripted. It's just effortless. This is what God has done for me, what he's doing in my life. And so by me sharing it, it's now blessing the listener. Now, how do you get a testimony then? 
Well, it says right here in the rest of that verse, it says that they love not their lives even unto death. Hold it. I have to die first before I can have a testimony? That doesn't work. I'm not going to be able to share what I have if I'm dead. Well, let's, let me just bring some light to what the two key words in this verse are that I think is going to really help us. First off, the word lives there, it's the Greek word suke. Suke is where we get the English word psyche. So lives there actually is the word soul, our mind, our will, our emotions, our intellect. Loving not our current way of thinking, even unto death. And that word death is the Greek word thanathos, which means the separation between the spiritual part of a person and the natural or the carnal part of a person. So if I want to have a testimony, I need to have my thinking changed. I need to have my mind renewed. And as I get my mind renewed, I begin to experience God in my own life. And once my experience has become personal, I have firsthand encounter, now I have a testimony to share. And I want to show you that the testimony isn't for you. It's for others. For you, it was you being saved by the blood of the Lamb. The testimony is your part to help save others. Remember, we're talking about changing the world. So let's look at another verse this morning. James chapter 1. James chapter 1. I want to show you then how. How do I get this mind renewed? How do I get my thinking changed? Because who, who here doesn't want to have a great story of what God's done in their lives? I, I share my stories all the time. I've got tons of testimonies. And when I feel like I run out of mine, I just go share in yours. And I leave out names. Don't, don't be uncomfortable. Uh, most cases, I'll leave your name out. Unless it's a really good one. No, I mean, I just, we share them all the time. Why? Are we trying to brag on, on our lives? No. Are we trying to brag on believers? Nope. But I am bragging on God. I do want to glorify him. I do want him to get the credit. And I want people to know that what he's done for me, he will do for you. He's no respecter of persons. So you're already there. James chapter 1, verse 17. He says, Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. Of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits of his, cre of his creatures. So then, my beloved brethren, let, not, let every man be swift to hear and slow to speak, slow to wrath, for the wrath of a man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore, lay aside all filthiness and overflow of, of wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. And receive the, with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls, which is your mind. So we're, we're, we're heading somewhere with this. But be doers of the word, not hearers, only deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. For he observes himself, goes away, and immediately he forgets what kind of man he was. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it, and is not a forgetful hearer but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does." The implanted word of God, which is able to save your mind. Do you know none of us have actually seen our own faces? Nobody's actually seen their own face. Well, sure, you're thinking, well, sure I have. You've seen a reflection of your face in the mirror, but you've never actually seen your face, right? Sorry for the graphic. You've never actually seen your face, but you've seen a reflection. So how do, I know that I, uh, how do I know that my tie was straight and that my hair was combed this morning before I came? I looked in the mirror. Make sure that I was presentable. Some of you, thank God, you looked in the mirror. You look stunning, by the way. Well done. You're welcome. So you looked in the mirror to see your reflection. Has anyone, when you got born again, you got a brand new spirit. Has anyone ever seen their spirit? So how do you know what it looks like? You look in the, the mirror. James, the brother of Jesus, says that we look in the perfect law of liberty. It's like a mirror. And so he says an interesting thing that I, I want to go back to, if I can find it here real quick. He says, um, verse 24, for he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. Interesting phrase, what kind of man. When you and I were lost in our sin, what man were we in? We were in Adam. Adam failed. I was born in Adam, so I was born a sinner. 
In order to be in Christ, I had to be born again. And so now I'm no longer in that man. I'm in the last Adam, Christ. And so I go to the perfect law of liberty to find out what do I look like now? Who am I and what man am I? I'm in Christ. So I, I go to the, the scriptures and I begin to identify the man I am. And I see, wait a minute. It's, that's, not, uh, that's not who I am. I, I need to, to review that. I, I need to take the word of God and I need to plant it. And then I, he says that I don't want to go away and be a forgetful hearer, but a doer. So has anyone got a garden planted in, at their house this year? Lots of hands. I don't think we're going to get one in this year, but we, I, we had one last year. So when, when, my, when my wife and, and my boy went out to make the garden, they planted a seed expecting to get a, a fruit of some sort, a, a, some type of vegetable or whatever they were growing. When you go out and you plant a seed, do you just go out there and plunk it in the ground and then come back at the end of summer and get your expecting that it's all going to be done? There's some work to be done, isn't there? I think that's why I stay away from the garden. They look like they're having fun. I mean, why ruin it, right? <laughs> they go out to the garden and they have to work the soil around it. They got to water it. Last summer, we, needed, we had a ton of heat, so they got to get out there and water it. They're working it the whole time. So that's what he's talking about and how we then become doers of it, not hearers only. I take the word of God and I, I implant it. And so when I'm not feeling like it's doing anything, I need to begin to cultivate that land again. I need to remind myself, encourage myself. Listen, I know how you feel, Phil, but I'm a believer, not a feeler. And uh, I need to water that with prayer, th thanking God that I am not that man. I, that might be what I did, but that's not who I am. I'm in this man. I'm reminding myself. Do you see what's happening? I'm cultivating that seed that was planted, and eventually it's going to grow, and that fruit is going to be so abundant. When I, uh, I, I can't ever remember what goes in gardens, but I do remember that corn is in gardens. So if I plant or someone plants a corn seed and it grows up, there's multiple. I mean, how many ears do you get on one stalk? Am I even using the right terminology? You get at least two, right? Oh, at, least. at least. Okay, great. So it's not just a replacement of the one seed. There's multiple. There's enough for me to share. I can feed my family. Do you see where we're going with this? There's fruit that develops in my life, and I have enough to share with people around me. We're talking about changing the world. It's important that I plant this seed of the word of God in my mind. It's capable of saving my soul, my mind, so that this fruit of God can now grow in my life because I need to share with others. It's not just for me to, to eat it on my own. So let's, look at, let's look at another verse. This is an, it's interesting. In, in Ephesians chapter 4, I know we're going back and forth here, but this now is the author's Apostle Paul. And it's as if he wrote this echoing what James had just written because it's like a continuation of the same thought pattern. Ephesians chapter 4, uh, verse number 17. He, Paul says, This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk. Now, Gentiles were just not Jews. They, they, weren't, they weren't following after God. They were just, it'd be like our modern day people that are just sinners. They're, they're not affiliated with Christ at all. He says, don't walk like them in the futility of their mind. And the word futility is just means devoid of truth, absence of truth. Having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart. That word heart is the same Greek word for mind. Their minds are darkened. It's not renewed. They haven't seen the light of God yet. Who being past feeling have given themselves over to lewdness to work all uncleanness and greediness, but you have not so learned Christ. If indeed you have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus, that you put off concerning your former conduct, look at that, the old man, which was in Adam, which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lust, but be renewed in the spirit of your, of your mind. Because my born-again spirit is, is, is forever changed. There was one sacrifice by Jesus that made my security. But now I need to get this thing caught up with what's happened in here. I need to have the, the spirit of my mind renewed. Verse 24, and that you put on the new man. Who's the new man? Christ, which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. So we need a testimony. How do I get one? Well, first off, we have to identify, what do you need? 
Are you sick in your body? Well, then we need to start there. Are you, are you dealing with depression? Then we need to start there. Are you dealing with a financial situation? Then we need to start there. Are you having a, uh, are you dealing with uh, relational issues? Are you, uh, we need to start there. Uh, have you yet to give your life to Christ? We definitely need to start there. That's how we get a testimony. So then what's the next step? Well, I need to begin to plant the word of God. Whatever that is. We, we, there's, the Bible is loaded with promises. And I, I plant that word, I cultivate that word, and I allow that thing to grow up within me, and it changes me. Now, I said this before, it's not the, the testimony isn't for you, it's for, the, for others around you. Now let's look at what the effect is. Let's see what that testimony does for those around you. Look in 2 Corinthians chapter 3. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, and this is powerful. Verse number 17 is where we're going to begin. This is the effect of your testimony on others. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 17. It says, Now the Lord is spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. Your, your translation may say freedom. But we all, with unveiled faces, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, and being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the spirit of the Lord. We are being transformed into the image of God from glory to glory. Now let me, let me point this out. This will encourage you. You are never less than glorious regardless of how you feel. I'm being transformed from glory to glory into the image of God. I'm never less than glorious. And when the devil comes whispering to you, trying to tell you the lies that, you, what, that what you're not, you remind him, I am never less than glorious because I am in Christ. We're being transformed into the image. Let's continue to read in, in chapter 4, verse number 1. It says, Therefore, since we have this ministry, what ministry? As we have received mercy, we do not lose heart. But we have renounced the hidden things of shame, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth. The word manifestation means to materialize. It means to actually present this truth. Commending others, or commending, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. But even if our gospel is veiled, it's veiled to those who are perishing, whose minds the God of this age has blinded, who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. When you and I manifest the truth of God, the promises of God, we manifest the glory of God. And that glory shines on their life, and it removes the blindness for a moment so that you can infuse the gospel. Your sharing, your story, your testimony brings the glory of God onto the situation, removes the blinders so they can receive the gospel. Uh, verse number five, for we do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your bondservants for Jesus' sake. For it is the God who commanded light to shine on, out of darkness, who has shown in our hearts, that word heart there again is our mind, to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. There was a poll that was done in 1990. And the poll was done um, among a, a large group of Americans. And the two questions that were asked, number one, is Jesus real? Is Jesus really God? And number two, is the Bible really truth? Out of everyone polled, 87% of Americans said yes, that Jesus is really God and that the Bible is true. That was 1990. 20 years later, um, or thereabouts, in, in, uh, in January of 2012, they, uh, they did the same poll, asked the same two questions. Is Jesus really God, and is the Bible really the truth? 8% of Americans believe that. Quite a drop. Honestly, when I saw it, I wasn't that surprised. And I'll tell you why. Because we as the church have not been demonstrating to the world the reality and the goodness of our God. And so they haven't experienced God yet. Or they haven't met you yet. They haven't met me yet. And so I see that as a statistic. I'm not blind. I realize that it's a, it's a, it's a dark thing. And the darker the world gets and the more evil it gets, the brighter we look. I said it last week. We could light a single candle, the one that goes on a cake, and light, drop all the lights in this room, and you're going to spot me from anywhere. I'm easier to find the darker it gets. 
The news is blasting all the negative things going on around the world. But I'm, I'm here to tell you what's happening in believers in this community is not an anomaly. The gospel is doing miraculous things across the world. Tens of thousands, millions of people are getting born again. And we're seeing, we're just not hearing about it on the mainstream news. It doesn't sell as well. Isn't it funny how we celebrate a news program when they, they have to actually make it a, a selling point that we're going to offer a good news story? Well, their 30-second good news story after an hour of negative news. So no wonder that people are, are wondering if God is real or not or the Bible is really truth because they haven't experienced it. One final passage and uh, we can actually, guys, get prepared to uh, distribute our communion now. In Mark chapter 5, Jesus has crossed over the sea and when he lands, a man filled with demons. In fact, when, he's, when he asked them, he says, they're legion, which is thousands this man's filled with demons. He races to Jesus. He says, Jesus, what on earth are you doing here? And what do you want to do with me? And so Jesus ends up, uh, they beg Jesus, don't cast us out into to darkness. And he, the, the man filled with demons looks over on the hill and he sees 2,000 pigs sitting there. And so the demons beg him. Go ahead. We can serve people. The demons beg beg Jesus, would you just cast us into the pigs as, as opposed to casting us into darkness? And that's exactly what he does. So these, these demons leave the man, they go into the pigs, and if you've read the story, the pigs race for the water and drown themselves. So here's this man. Thank you. So here's this man who has been in, filled with demons and so violent, so mean, that they have him shackled with chains to a, a stinking cave in the middle of the hills. He's not there. And he it says in scripture that he broke these chains and he would cut himself with rocks. I mean, he was violent. People were afraid of this man. Well, by now, people in the nearby city have heard word that Jesus had come and they'd come sprinting out there. And all of a sudden they notice out of the corner of their eye, here's the guy, here's the violent guy. They don't know yet that he's been delivered. Several years back, maybe 15 years ago, I was helping a friend of mine who, who owns a dairy farm. And I'd gone out into the pasture to bring in the second group of, of cows that were about to be milked. And I mistakenly walked up and about from Andrew away to me was standing the bull. I was scared. If you've ever been that, I mean, a bull, bulls are big. And they can kill you. Slowly and painfully. I was scared. And I tiptoed away as I was praying in tongues, trying to get away from the, the away from the, the, the bull. But that's what I imagine. They show up and here's this guy who's violent and mean. They don't know he's free yet. And they begin to notice that he's not foaming and breaking things. And, and the man who was filled with demons, he says to Jesus, Jesus, can I go with you? Can I follow you? Will you take me with you? And this is Jesus' response to the man. He says, no, this is what I want you to do. In verse 20, Mark 5, 20, he says, I want you to go into the city and I want you to tell everyone about the goodness of God. And so in verse 20, he says, And he departed, and he began to proclaim in Decapolis all that Jesus had done for him, and all marveled. This man that was lost and bound and demon-possessed, he goes back into the city, the city called Decapolis. This is actually a word that translates for ten cities. That's what it means. Well, I've come to, I've come to appreciate that everything in Scripture is on purpose. Decapolis means 10 cities. Guess what the Hebrew number 10 means? Testimony. He sent him in to be a testimony of what God has done for him. And everyone marveled. Folks, we need to have a testimony in our lives to impact and change the world. Amen. Let's stand. We'll take communion together. Communion is a wonderful, powerful thing that we get to do. Do you know communion is something that we do corporately once a month, but it doesn't mean that it's going to be done once a month. I know people and I have friends that take communion daily. And that really communion, Jesus said, as often as you do this, do this in remembrance of me. And remembrance in the Hebrew is a different terminology than what you and I typically think of remembrance, like I just kind of reflect on or I memorize a fact. Remembrance in Hebrew culture means to reenact. So no, we're not going to reenact a crucifixion this morning. But on that cross was nailed or pinned to that cross your sin, your disease, your discouragement, your financial need. This morning, if you're feeling 
like you need a healing in your body. If you're feeling that you need a release from depression or you need a a financial breakthrough, we're going to reenact. That means that I'm going to remember that that was paid for 2,000 years ago. And I'm doing this to remind myself of this covenant that I'm in. The elements are very powerful. The bread that we're about to eat is representing the body of Jesus. Jesus' body was so brutally destroyed that the scripture teaches us that he was unrecognizable by people that knew him. He carried in that moment every person's sin, every person's disease. And so he was so marred and so beaten, he paid a debt, a sinner's debt, one that you and I owed. And in that moment, he took it all. And it says that God turned away from him because he took the shame that God should be turning away from you and I. So this is a precious moment. Let's pray. Father, as we take this bread, we we remember that all those years ago, that on that cross, on that day, you pinned death and sin and destruction. And you purchased our peace, our healing, our liberty. So we pull on that now, Lord. I just declare over each person that our bodies are being healed and made whole right now in Jesus' name. I thank you that our minds are becoming squared away and back to a place of peace and that the storm is dissipating. I thank you, Lord, that our financial situation is reverting, that we are in line with you, and we are, even in our finances, we're going from glory to glory. That this is part of our testimony, that I'm no longer in the first man, I'm in the the last Adam, Christ. And because of that price that you paid for me today, with reverence in our heart, we honor you, and we take this bread, and we thank you for the price that was paid. Let's eat. take this cup that represents the blood of Jesus that didn't just cover up our sins but it cleansed us from the inside out and that cleansing on the inside out then changes the behavior of who we are we take this cup this morning God and we are so swelled with confidence that you'll never turn from us you'll never forsake us you'll never fail us we never have to be worried that God is going to abandon us we have confidence that we have become sons and daughters and we are part of this great inheritance. You cleanse our minds, our conscience. We we think differently. We act differently. We are different. My DNA now lines up with your bloodline. We take this cup with humility and honor this morning, corporately. Let's drink. every eye is closed and every head's bowed (coughs) I want to take this moment there's two things that I want to address today number one we're talking about change in the world and Revelation 12 11 says that we overcome him the enemy sin death and destruction by the blood of the lamb and that simply means Jesus introduces a terminology of being born again and you know throughout Christian history we've tried to change what it is well I don't want to be called Christian because the world has become so negative thinking about Christians so I know what we'll do we'll, we'll call ourselves Christ followers and then and then maybe that wasn't doesn't work out and we come up with some other terminology do you know your identity being called a Christian isn't something like a badge that we wear to go tell someone else it was King Agrippa who came up with it when he looked at Paul and it was just the best way that he could describe you look a lot like Jesus so I'm gonna call you a Christian you look like Jesus to me so becoming a Christian isn't about affiliation with a denomination it's not about affiliation with this church for that for that matter but becoming a Christian means that I've now stepping from death into life that means I'm becoming a son or a daughter that I am overcoming this world and whatever this world can present because I'm no longer dependent on myself and maybe you found yourself even as we sang that song that you came to our rescue you know that today you're at the end of yourself and you've run out you're no longer maybe you've never been connected to the source and so you're like the empty hose so we talk about all these things and you know it it sounds great but until you've become part of the one Jesus Christ these aren't things that are afforded to you today is the day of salvation today is the moment that you can leave here with absolute confidence that eternal life begins today 
not just when I die, but I get to enjoy the quality of life, the peace of God, the healing in my body, the healing in my mind. I can live in a place of peace. This fruit that I talked about today can begin to present itself in my life that I've been rescued. I can now become a rescuer. This morning, if I'm describing you and you've never made a decision to follow Christ with your whole heart, that means that I'm no longer the Lord. I'm giving him over the reins. I want you to boldly slip your hand up. I'm the only one looking. I just want to know who I'm praying with. This morning could be the best day. It's not the end of your life. It's the start of your life. The best moment. The best is yet to come. We're going to pray this together. If, if you didn't raise your hand and you should have. Church, let's pray this together. Say, Father, I give my life to you. I thank you, Jesus, for dying in my place. I'm sorry, Lord, for my sin. And I'm sorry for being my own Lord. I want to change. I receive that change. I receive righteousness now. And I receive the peace of God that comes from being a son being a daughter. Help me to serve you all the days of my life. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Father, I just declare a blessing over each one as we go today. I thank you that as uh, the rest of our afternoon, starting a new week, that we get to so shine Christ. May the testimonies of God be manifest and materialized. May the glory of God so impact everyone around us that we're like that hose being so filled that we gush everywhere. Thank you, Lord, for your goodness and your grace today. We leave here this today differently. Thank you for encountering us. Thank you for impacting us and changing our mind. In Jesus' name, amen. If you need personal prayer or encouragement for any reason at all, uh, we have our prayer team available. The ushers are coming down the center aisle to take your cups. Uh, we can discard those. If you need to leave right away, we understand. Have a great week. We call you blessed. We pray that you were blessed by this message. If you are curious about our ministry or would like to talk to someone, you can contact us through our website, BelieversChristianChurch.com.